spirit brooding like a dove spoke the earth into existence for creation that he loved and man was born of perfect image made to be a friend of god meant to dwell within his presence yeah it's where we all belong holy spirit
let this be an upper room. Let this be an upper room. Light the flame we burn for you. Holy, holy, holy spirit. Lift it up, come on. And like a do that whole part again. Let this be an upper room, church. Lift your voices. So let
joy of my salvation Take me back to where it all began oh, All I ever wanted was your presence How I long to be there once again My life is an altar to you yes. Breathe again Hold the embers that burn in my heart A love taken back to the start Cause my life is an altar to you Yes, it is Breathing a pure prayer together church to so give us clean hands and give us pure heart and let us not lift our souls to another 
Give us clean hands, won't you? And give us pure hearts. And let us not lift our souls to another. And no oh God, let us be a generation that seeks and seeks your face. Oh God, Jacob. Oh God, let a generation that seeks you, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. We're gonna sing that whole thing again, guys. So give us clean hands, you sing. a moment when the lights went out when death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every breath of blood And one final breath and it was finished yeah. But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens rose? Sing it out.
again. One more time, church, loud. All hail. worshiping with us, lifting up God's name. He's deserving. He's worthy. We praise him in this place together, and it's an honor. So we love you. You guys are already taking a seat. You're on it. We've got some amazing things coming up here at Kested. So check out our announcements, and we hope that you guys enjoy this service. We love you. Hello, welcome to Kesset. My name is Emily and I serve on the photography team here at Kesset, and I'm here to deliver your news. For all of our new guests at our in-person services, we'd love to give you a small gift to say hello, which you can get at the Welcome Center in the lobby. Our Welcome Center team is also available to answer any questions you may have and let you know about how to find more about upcoming events. Giving is one of the ways to participate in worship here at Kesson. If you fill in your heart to give through tithes and offerings, we have several ways to do that, which include our giving boxes, kiosk in the lobby, text to give, and our church app. Thank you for your generosity. Youth camp is just a few weeks away. Help us raise funds for our students to go to Summer Escape Youth Camp at our hot dog fundraiser happening after service. For only $5, you can get a hot dog, chips, and a drink. Our goal is to not let financial hardship keep any students from coming to camp. Thank you for considering supporting our students. We know summer can be a busy time with our kids, trips, and other fun stuff. So we wanted to share with you a couple ways to stay connected to what's happening here at Kesed. Our favorite way is the church app. There's so many things you can do from watching live stream and past messages, getting the sermon notes, checking out all our events and more. Get it today on the app store or Google Play. If you like podcasts, we have all of our weekend messages available to listen to and download at kesed.com slash podcasts. You can also get info about what's happening here at Kesed on our website or social media. Thanks again so much for joining us here at Kesed. Please feel free to take the next few minutes to say hello to someone, or you can use the QR code to fill out a hello card so we can get to know you better. We will continue with our service shortly. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Kesed. My name is Danny. I am one of the pastors I'm going to be sharing with you. Uh, if you're new, thank you for being here today on this beautiful sunny Sunday. Um, this, is a, this is a good day to come and talk about God and who he is and uh, maybe even grow a little bit in relationship with him and with each other. We're in a series right now called Oaks from Ashes, and uh, we're talking about this idea of uh, embracing uh, the ancient, embracing the, the tried and the true spiritual disciplines that uh, throughout the last 2,000 years have continued to drive Christians into more and more um, intimacy with their creator. Uh, each week we've taken just one topic and we've just kind of tried to do as deep a dive as we can in the 30 minutes that I share with you or whoever's talking that particular weekend. And uh, today is no different except for today... Uh, is a topic that is a little bit messy, and I think for some of you going to be a little bit uncomfortable, and I, I hope that you can um, just, just continue to embrace and know that, uh, that the Holy Spirit has something planned for you in it. Uh, today we're going to talk about the spiritual practice of confession. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, see? I've already done this twice, so I knew what to prepare in the room. Last time, some guy in the back went, oh. That's all it said. I was like, ooh, that's going to be an awkward drive home after church. But um, 
Uh, this, this is a really important, important spiritual discipline, and I'm hoping today you leave here understanding why. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Uh, throughout the Bible, we can see that this, this, uh, this call to confess is a, a pretty consistent and constant part of what it means to follow God. Confession holds a lot of spiritual weight. It's, uh, it's not something you can just kind of lightly dip into. It's not something that you can just be like, well, I'm just going to do it how I feel it. Uh, there is a way in which you are supposed to do it, and that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to take Richard Foster's definition of confession. I like it based on the few that uh, we pulled from this week. He says this, Confession is sharing our deepest weaknesses and failures with God and trusted others so that we may enter into God's grace and mercy and experience his ready forgiveness and healing. So confession has a goal. It's not to just be exposed. It's not to just get something off our chest. It's not just to uh, receive the consequences and get them behind us. That's not the goal. The goal of confession is that we experience first and foremost the forgiveness and healing presence of a restored relationship with our creator. That's the ultimate goal of confession. And oftentimes the byproduct of that is uh, a better and more intimate relationship also with the fellow uh, traveler that we walk alongside while living out our lives upon this planet. Now, I'm going to unpack confession in a little bit of a provocative way. Uh, I'm warning you because uh, Thursday service, if, if, if this goes bad, I just want you to blame Thursday service because <laughs> Thursday service is where we tried all this. We don't record that service. It's our first of the three that we speak here at Uptown. And, uh, and we took a vote on a few different things. We were like, should we, can Sunday handle that? You know, can online handle that? Uh, can this stay in the universe of, of Kessid material? And they voted yes on everything. So, so, so you're just going to get it all today. And uh, this is what God has laid upon my heart. And uh, again, if you, have, if you have questions or concerns, um, come on a Thursday and give, give your peace of mind right. to somebody there. Amen? <laughs> to really understand confession, I believe we first have to take a little bit deeper look at forgiveness. Much of Jesus' teachings and a third of his parables are all based around and teaching about forgiveness. Passages like in Matthew 18 when Peter comes up to him because he's just tired of being offended. And he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus looks at him and says, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. That every time someone asks for you to forgive them, you are supposed to, with all your might and help from God, forgive them. Matthew 6, 14 says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. What we know is that because of the work of the cross and because of the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice, we are freely offered forgiveness. But the interesting thing about that forgiveness is how tightly it's tied back to our confession. Romans 10, very well-known verse 9 and 10 says, because... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Confession is like a key to the doorway of Christ and his salvation. Because nobody comes to Christ without confession. Anywhere. Ever. And... Forgiveness is tied to that confession. And I think the church has done a really, really bad job of teaching that. Instead, what the church has done is said that anyone who comes to you and offends you, no matter their, their posture, no matter whether they, they think they hurt you, no matter if they hurt you and they enjoyed hurting you, or they hurt you and got away with it, anyone who comes to you because of Jesus and the cross you have to forgive them. 
And I'm here to tell you, I don't see that in the Bible. I don't know if you know this or not, but God doesn't forgive everybody. That's why he separates the sheep from the goats. It's the forgiven from the unforgiven. The wheat from the chaff. It's the forgiven and the unforgiven. And I think the church sometimes likes to push its theology because church wants people to get along and church wants people to grow. And, and we all know, of course, that holding on to things, great trauma, great hurt, great pain is, is bad for us. And so whenever we come to, to, to somebody else in the body and we're like, this person hurt us, and this person's like, I didn't hurt you, or this person's like, you deserve to be hurt, or this person's like, I got away with it, so to your face I'm going to say, yeah, I hurt you, but to everybody else I'm going to say I'm not, the church goes, listen, just big spiritual bandage all over all of it. Just forgive them and let go. Turn the other cheek and walk away. But that's not what we see at all God doing. We see God responding every single time through the power of the cross to anyone who confesses with their mouth. Anyone. But I'm just here to teach, based on what I see, that if you don't confess, that you need Jesus Christ, if you don't confess the power of the cross, if you've decided that your deeds are good enough and you're just, just smarter than every other human that's ever come before you, you are living a life unforgiven. That also means that some of you in this room, the reason that you keep cycling back to this pain that, you, that, that the church somewhere along the way said you're supposed to forgive. Like I, I had a lady say I wake up every morning with this thought in my head of this damage that was done to me. And every single morning, I'm like, God, I forgive them. God, I forgive them. God, I forgive them. This was after this service. And she's like, so you're telling me I don't have to forgive them? And I said, well, yes. <laughs> I told you, this is going to get sticky here for a second. Yes, but I am telling you to release them to God. You're still supposed to release it. It's the same thing as, as, in a sense as forgiveness. When someone comes to you, please forgive me. I'm releasing that because their sin, even their sin to me, is not bigger than the blood of Jesus Christ. There's just nothing that, that, that they could do to me that I, that I shouldn't release. But the reality is there is damage that has been done to people that have never asked for forgiveness. And so that release is still needed. And so we are called to be a people who release those people to God. And let go of that burden, for he is the one who makes all things right. Romans 12, 19, beloved, that's us, by the way. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There's a lot of people who've experienced a lot of abuse, and somebody just put a little churchy bandage over it and said, well, you should just forgive them and move on. Why is this still affecting you? Do you know why it's affecting you? Because your job is not to forgive and move on. It's to release them to God and his justness and his justice yeah. and to trust that he will make all things new. But it all requires confession. I want to say one other thing about forgiveness, really important. Uh, if someone comes to you and they say, will you forgive me? I've harmed you in this way. They confess. According to the Bible, we are to release that. Because the blood of Jesus is bigger than any sin that I could commit or that could be committed upon me. But it does not mean that we have to restore a relationship. Right. It does not mean that consequences go away. It does not mean that they just get to show up at Thanksgiving. Everything's forgotten. Nope, it doesn't say forget. Right. It says forgive. As a matter of fact, when Jesus is on the cross, he has a thief on either side. One of them is, is cursing and, and, and slurring and, and proclaiming basically this world and, and all of its pain. And he's, he's, he is where he is. And the other one says, why are you doing this to this man? Don't you see who he is? He recognizes and confesses that Jesus is Lord. And suddenly Jesus turns to that thief and he forgives him by saying, you will be with me today in paradise. But he's still on the cross, folks. He just doesn't suddenly pop down from the cross and go, well, that was fun. <laughs> he, he doesn't just suddenly not, not experience the consequences of his behavior. Forgiveness does not mean restoration of relationship. Sometimes it does, but not always. And a lot of people have used that, that loophole of forgiveness to get back into relationship and sometimes even cause more damage. And so your job and mine is to forgive, to release, to trust 
that God's blood is bigger than anything I've done or that's been done to me. And for people who haven't confessed, your job is to release them to God all the same, for he is bigger and more, and he sees you in the midst of that hurt that maybe only you and the person who hurts you know about. And I'm sorry that the church has taught us this. And I'm sorry that I'll probably get emails later with people who still want to live by this. It's Danny C at KessetChurch.com, by the way, if you'd like to send those in. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want this to be a place where people can find healing. I want it to be a place of restored relationship but I want it most importantly to be a place that is based on how God teaches us to live our lives. And there's no point teaching anything further in confession if you don't understand that confession is tied directly to your and my forgiveness. You don't just get to take an inoculated shot, you know, a shot of Jesus at church on Sunday or accept him at camp when you're, you know, 12 and then suddenly every sin just doesn't really matter because the blood of Jesus is more powerful than anything that that I can do to anybody. No, you're supposed to confess. And some of you, by the end of service, will feel that strongly upon your heart. If confession was a person, I think it would look a lot like that of King David. So what I want to do for us to see that is break down a portion of his story that illustrates this the best. We're going to break it down into three parts. The first one, part one, David and secrets. It says that David has uh, accomplished a lot. He's suffered a lot. He's, he's overcome a lot. He's experienced a lot. And he is living his best life. His generals are out overcoming the enemies of God's kingdom. He's at home in his palace, even though most likely he should be out with his generals doing the work of God. But he decides to take a break for a month or so, let's say. And it says he's enjoying the spring weather in 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the, te- the time when kings go out to battle, instead David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened one late afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. The first thing I want to address in the story, because I've heard it preached multiple different ways, I just want to address that in this culture at this time, the incredible uh, amounts of uh, oppression that women went through at this time and how incredible the power structure here is, here is being misused by David upon a woman who, who in, in this nation is a little better than most, but even here is, doesn't really rate a lot higher than property. So I've seen people been like, well, clearly, you know, it takes two, and Bathsheba participated clearly, but we don't really understand the circumstances around what would have happened if Bathsheba would have not participated. So let's just let's just put that out there. The second thing I want you to see, just to drive home the point that David just wanted whatever David wanted during this season of his life, is that if you go back in David's story, especially during the time when he's writing some of the more beautiful psalms, there's this great suffering that's happening while David is being pursued by the king before him who is incredibly wicked and insecure. His name is Saul. David ends up holding up in this cave. It's known as the cave of Adullam. And a lot of people think he lived in and out of this cave for almost 10 years. And that within this cave, David became the David we know as as suffering and hurt and pain and trial and, and opportunity for revenge and all these different things came at him. And he passed, if you will, test after test and slowly became the David that he was. While in this cave, men started to gather around him. They got all the way to about 300. They became known as his mighty men and they did mighty, mighty things on behalf of David because they believed in him so much. Now, there's a reason that we know that Bathsheba's 
uh, husband's name was Uriah because the writers want you to realize something. First, they want you to realize that the reason David could see her from the roof of his palace is because of how close her house was to his, the houses of honor that probably belonged to most of David's mighty men that lived around his palace. And if you go and look at a list of mighty men, did you know whose name is mentioned among them? Uriah. This was not just some woman. David wasn't confused who she was. This was the wife of a friend. And he abused his power. And the consequence was that she got pregnant. And this would have been a great opportunity for David to confess. But he doesn't. Instead, he puts in a motion a plan to cover it up. Because that's what always, always happens. This is an unbelievably important spiritual truth. Sin wants to remain unknown at any cost. So David went and called Uriah home. This dude called Uriah home from the front and then said, Uriah, I just wanted to you know, have you help me maybe send some letters back and forth. Why don't you take a few days, just hang out with your wife. Just relax with your wife. Are we clear what's, what's being set up here for Uriah? Okay. Yeah, he's liking to cover up the pregnancy. But Uriah is an honorable man. He's one of David's mighty men, most likely. And so Uriah's like, I'm not going to go home. Everybody else is on the front lines risking their lives. No, I'm going to stay in the barracks. No, I'm going to stay out front. I'm not going home. Multiple times, David's like, How, how'd last night go with your wife? What was her name again? Uh, starts with a B, I think. What? And the whole time Uriah's like, I'm not doing that, David. So David after many sleepless nights, I'm sure, realizes he's about to be exposed and so feels that he has no choice. And so he writes a letter with, with information about the battle and he hands it to Uriah, who he knows is so honorable he will not open the letter, and he sends the letter with Uriah back to the front. And in the letter was instructions to have Uriah move to the front of the battle where David hoped he would be killed, which is exactly what happened. Verse 26, same chapter, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son, and he got away with it, and Uriah's gone. No justice for him. And then it ends with this small line, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Because the Lord sees all the untalked about, unincorporated, unexposed things within our lives. And that leads us to part two, David and confession. Chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sends a friend to David, a prophet. His name is Nathan. And I like to imagine they came, they had their normal courtly gestures, and then maybe they retired that night, just the two of them, over lit torches, looking out over the beautiful city, and there's grapes on the table and some wine and other things. That just make sure you understand, this is a conversation between friends. And he came to him, and as they talked, he eventually looked at David, and he said, David, can I tell you a story? David said, you know you can tell me stories, Nathan. He says, there were two men in a city. The one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up. It grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. And he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Now, at this point in the story, you would think David's putting two and two together, maybe. That, that he's starting to see, maybe. Just, just what it was Nathan's trying to say. But I just want to say this really quick. When you have unconfessed sin in your life, you have secrets. And the moment you have secrets, you don't have intimacy. Not only with your friends, but with yourself. 
and you can't see your rhythms. You can't see the cycles that continue to repeat time and time again because you've told yourself a narrative. I didn't have any choice. It was my only option. Listen, I'm the king. He's just a bud. And at the end of the day, who did it really hurt? And so David responds to his friend's story. So much self-righteousness. It says that David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he threw his wine in the grapes. He doesn't say that, but I think it probably happened. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, all the guards get nervous, like, oh, David is decreeing something. The man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Everybody knows I love lambs. I used to be a shepherd. This will not happen in my kingdom. We will protect the lambs. Bring in the legislation. Let's put some laws into place for losers like this guy. And he's thinking Nathan's going to be like, I just love that God anointed you our king. You're so good at what you do, King David. And he adjusts the crown on his head because he still wears it even though it's evening and nobody cares. But he's gotten used to it and he likes the way it feels. (laughs) There's a lot of human in the Bible if you just let it happen, isn't there? (laughs) You see, David had become blind to the very narrative of his own story, even when it's read back to him. And then Nathan sets down his glass, and he leans forward like only older men can. (laughs) With cold blue eyes, he looks into David's, and he says, David, you are the man. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Because if you, if you just kind of take it into our culture, like David did a good thing. He defended the, the, the poor man, and his first words are, you're the man. Maybe just, at first, maybe just for a second, David was like, that's right, I'm the man. I am the man. I got this crown. I got good stuff going on. I am the man. And then Nathan continues, thus says the Lord God of Israel, excuse me, I anointed you king of Israel. And I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you a master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. And David shifts back because he knows he's caught. And the Lord through Nathan asks, Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. He exposes every little detail because God knows every little detail of your secrets and mine, all of them. I wonder what would have happened early on if David would have just confessed instead of being blind to his own narrative. I wonder what would have happened when he told that earlier story if he just would have been like, Nathan, I got to tell you something. I realize your story. You probably haven't put this together, but it reminds me of something I'm currently dealing with within my own life. But instead, he offers up his excuse and the Lord responds with consequence. Verse 10 Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And then the Lord goes a little difficult and heavy. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. This is a really important thing to realize about God. Hashtag, the Lord does not mess around. (laughs) Oh, Uriah is going to get his justice. Be clear. Because God does not mess around with his people. He loves you too much. He loves me too much. He loves Uriah too much and Bathsheba too much to let us get away with whatever we want just because we like the feel of the crown upon our heads. And so David becomes David in that chair. He becomes overwhelmed and overrun. And I think he pauses a long, long time as the tears fall down his face For his only response is, I have sinned against the Lord. Part three, 
David and repentance. The confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. This is because in confession we hand over the pretense, the image management, the manipulation, the control, and the obsession with self. You see, repentance is changing your action to catch up with your confession. You may or may not realize this, but you can confess without repentance, but you can't repent without confession. You can go, yeah, I did it, and I'll do it again. I did it because. I did it this way. But you cannot repent You cannot apologize. You cannot show up before God or your fellow man or woman and repent without first fully confessing. Mm -hmm. I cannot, you cannot, and David could not. I feel like the church often forgets this important principle. You see, we are called to bring a loving but very acute message of repentance for the lost and the hurting. Matthew 4, 17 says about Jesus, from that time he began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is like a significant part of our gospel message. This is what we're still supposed to be doing, but we're terrible at it. We're not terrible at actually pointing at someone and saying, repent, I can see your sin from here, sir. By the way, I can't see anybody back in that corner, so if you're... Somebody just fell out of their chair and they're like, I did it! No, relax. A lot of lights. I'll point to you, sir. No, just kidding. Repent, right? That's what we're, it's, it's easy to call people to repentance. You call me, I call you. It's, it's easy to see other people's stuff. But when the lost and hurting actually show up to repent, they very organically through the Holy Spirit begin to confess what they're repenting of. And the problem is, We as a church have turned them away because their sin is either too much or more often too different than our own. I don't know if you know this, but we've got some like some sin inside the church. Maybe we'll teach a series on this sometime that's, you know, when it comes to like certain sins, as long as you're in the club and you attend Sunday on a regular basis, they're not that big a deal. But we got other sins, I'm here to tell you. (laughs) I got a neighbor you would never believe. (laughs) <laughs> basically the crown on his head just is made of a different material than the one on yours. You enjoy yours very much. I know I enjoy mine. But have you seen that thing? We turn these people away when they confess. And then they go back out into the world trying to survive. When really their very confession was supposed to be what brought them home. I'm going to read something Foster writes over the whole church. I'm going to make sure I'm included in it. But this is what he says. And this this is in order to... uh, This is in order to bring straight up conviction. He says, Confession is a difficult discipline for us because we all too often view the believing community as a fellowship of saints before we see it as a fellowship of sinners. We feel that everyone else has advanced so far into holiness that we are isolated and alone in our sin. We cannot bear to reveal our failures and shortcomings to others. We imagine that we are the only ones who have not stepped onto the high road of heaven. And this is why we keep our secrets, folks. Because I can't share with you stuff I'm dealing with in my life if all you're going to do is look at me and go, oh, pity. I don't need your pity, and you don't need mine. What we need when we confess is to be held in a way that allows for repentance to take root so that the Holy Spirit can do the work that the cross was intended to do. Revelations 3.19 says, Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Repent. It is God's love that brings forth repentance that can't be brought forth without confession. It is God's love that someone walks into a space and says, I think i got to tell somebody some stuff I'm carrying. It is God's love that pulls forth from their innermost being and wants to to connect inside this ether of, of God's presence that we're supposed to be in the community. It is not your skill set or your articulation or your kind face 
or even your prayer life. It is God's love that brings it all forth. And it is our responsibility to hold it. But we can't hold it unless we actually do it ourselves. For if we don't do it ourselves, we are simply hypocrites like David putting lamb laws into place while impregnating our best friend's wives. We need to do better. I need to do better. We need to sit in spaces like this and just let it be uncomfortable. We need to remember what it's like to live in that cave with our friends around the campfire. As God did something with our lives that is doing something with our lives that we don't deserve. I want to give you a few practical things when it comes to confessing. A few things I want you to take home. First off, be thoughtful about who you choose to both confess to and receive confession from. Make sure they are always walking upon the same path that repentance is calling you down. Hopefully it would be a fellow follower of Christ because you can't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit when two people get in a room and confess. Oftentimes when someone confesses to me, almost always it seems I end up confessing something back to them. It's just the Holy Spirit's like, he's just too aware. Be aware of that when you're confessing, sharing with someone, especially someone you haven't hurt. You're just walking with a brother or a sister. You're like, can I share something with you I've been struggling with? Make sure that it's someone who's walking the same path of repentance. Don't just share with a buddy because he knows how to keep a secret. Second, some of that goes out the table when it's you confessing to someone that you've harmed. Because you're not sharing a secret anymore. You're acknowledging pain that you caused. So sometimes you've got to come forward and you've got to confess to somebody that either it's going to bring healing to or accountability to. Both of these, I believe, are paths that lead you towards repentance. Second, don't only confess big things, heavy things and dark things. As a matter of fact, some of you need to start with just confessing the everyday things. My wife and I got into a fight over toothpicks last week. (laughs) See, she has a spice drawer, and it looks like the spice people came alive at night and murdered each other. And I can't stand it. And so I decided to be the husband that I am and serve her quietly while only making, like, huffs and groans, but not saying anything with my mouth. I emptied the spice drawer, and I wiped it all down. And as I put things back, I started realizing that we had, like, just a multiple variety of, of, of toothpicks and toothpick holders. And, and we had this one thing we've had forever that's this broken uh, toothpick. Some of you probably got it. It looks like this. You're supposed to press on it and it pops up one toothpick. Never works. Never works. It's garbage. I hate it. <laughs> so I threw it away. It's just what you do to garbage. You put it in the garbage. I did it like this. Stepped on the lid up. Right? Then I found a bunch of other little, little useless stuff. My wife said, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm cleaning out your murdered spice drawers. First off, what I'm doing. And second, I'm tired of these toothpicks. I can't handle it anymore. Got to draw a line. So I quietly ordered a brand new toothpick holder from Amazon. Look what I did. $9.95, folks. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. When you open it up, look how it swirls the toothpick. I'm like a Somali, I'm like a Somalier of toothpicks now, right? I'm just like, hmm, what vintage is this? You know what vintage they are? Bamboo, because they're the best. They never splinter. If you haven't had a bamboo toothpick yet, you ain't ever had a toothpick ever. I bought this. She goes, this is ridiculous. I said, not only did I buy that, I bought 4,000 bamboo toothpicks. There's a thousand on each box and you flip it over. There's another thousand on the bottom. I said, this is what leadership looks like, Aaron. I'm done with it. (laughs) She made a comment and I made a comment. Next thing you know, we're not talking for like a half hour because of me and my, my, my toothpick crisis. She then comes to me and she says, I just want to show you something. And she's got this look on her face and she shows me this. She's like, see this? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, I told you we had a toothpick holder that worked. 
I'm like, first off, gross. Have you seen my toothpick holder? Pretty sure we got that when we got married. <laughs> Second, those toothpicks are terrible. They're not even pointed on each side. They got like a weird club baseball handle on the one side. Nobody, what kind of people are coming over with teeth like that? That's what I want to know. <laughs> and so, this was our, our war. I told her right away, I said, I'm taking pictures of all this. I'm telling the church. She looked at me with a really unique, uneasy, I've not seen her quite so acquiesce so like readily. She was like, fine, do it. I said, I am. I'm going to tell them all about it. She goes, do it. It was weird. I didn't understand. So I preached this sermon on Thursday. She didn't say a word. Afterwards, she was like, some people came up. They're like, bamboo's the best. And I was like, those are people, they know stuff. <laughs> I preached it at the 9 o'clock service. She didn't say a word. Until she came into my office and showed me her phone. <laughs> and it was a text from her mother. The start of the text was, this is an amazing series. I love this talk. It's so good. And I was like, that's right. Even your mom knows. <laughs> and then she scrolled up. And her mom said, he threw away the toothpick holder I bought you. <laughs> she knew the whole time. She set me up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, mother. But it was garbage. <laughs> set me up. Set me up bad. So be thoughtful who you choose. Be thoughtful who you choose. You don't have to confess everything, right? Sometimes you can just confess stuff, not just heavy stuff, I mean. And then lastly, and this, is, this I think is a, is a special close. Sometimes you've got to confess stuff that you just never thought you'd have to confess. Stuff that, that at the time didn't even seem like anything that worthy of bringing back up. We did a worship night here last Sunday. It was amazing. It was, we had almost 300 people here. We had a baptismal set up. We had communion and prayer. And we're going to do another one in the future. We're just going to keep doing these things. But uh, there were 17 people that got baptized. Some signed up. Some people, yep, just happened in the room. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but, but baptismals are, are uh, basically acts of confession. They're people getting in the water. They're, they're, they're uh, confessing to a room that, that I by myself cannot purge the things. And I recognize the power of Jesus and the cross and all these things. They're repenting. And they get in the water and they go under the water old, completely submerged, and they come back up new. Washed clean, drenched in the spirit of God. It's just beautiful and powerful. Pastor Potter did the first half or so and I did the second half. I was sitting in the pool towards the end and I had noticed a woman during, uh, during the worship time come up on stage, and I didn't really pay attention, but I saw her up on stage for a half hour or so uh, because people were spread all about the room. And this woman ended up coming down to me, and as she came up closer to me, I realized as she uh, kind, of, kind of sat next to the pool and talked to me that it was Kimber. And I think Kimber's probably here this morning, this service. But Kimber came up, and she goes, can I share something with you? Now, I don't know if you remember Kimber from a while back, but Kimber had just an, a really scary and incredible and powerful uh, cancer story. Uh, this is a picture of our a baptismal from a while ago of Kimber and I together and her being baptized. And God has done some really powerful stuff in her life, in her heart, and in her body. And so I was kind of confused, like, why she was here. I knew she'd already been baptized. She goes, I don't know if you saw me up on the stage. And I go, oh, okay, it was you. And she says, and I'm, and I'm summarizing lots of talks this week about this moment right here as a gift from the Holy Spirit through her to you. But she says, all week long, I've been feeling this sense that I need to worship God in, a, in kind of a different space. And I said, well, tell me more. And she goes, well, as I go through the cancer story, of course, I'm, I'm praying to God for salvation and I'm praying to God for healing and I'm praying to God for all these things. And then as I get through the other side, normal life stuff starts to happen. And I, I basically started to feel this conviction that, that, that I, I could have worshiped God differently in the midst of all the stuff. And I think I need to confess that. And so what I did is I went up on stage and I brought with me all the records from my journey, my correspondence, my diagnosis, all the records. And I laid them out and I ripped them in pieces
And then I added something else. And then I worshiped. This is confession. And it's custom to you and your story. And it's not meant to bring shame. It's meant to bring relief and healing and hope. And it may be something you've done or something you've held secret. Or it may be something God is bringing forth in your spirit right now that you had no idea you even needed to hold space within. But when you can stand in this place and be honest with God, you can experience his love, his purging, his restoration, and his healing like never before, just like King David did. Psalm 51, to the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. No, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Heavenly Father, from this space right here, it would be impossible to do anything else but to just recognize that you're gonna do what you wanna do with this confession this week. My prayer, Lord, is that you lead people wisely to one another in the right posture, and even more importantly, Lord, to you, that there would be a great heartbreak within our church, that we would know that You are the one who builds. You are the one who takes away. Cleanse us, Lord, so that we may tell transgressors like us about your holy name. May we be a house of worship and a house of praise and a house of generosity and a house of love. And Lord, may we be a house of confession. We repent, Lord. I repent, Lord. Allow me to see with eyes what it is you want to show me and allow our church to praise you from that place as we all look upon you and thank you for the forgiveness of your son and the power of Jesus on the cross. We love you, Father. 
We lift this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah, I love you guys very much. I went way long today. I blame it on most of you in here because the Holy Spirit was like, not yet, not yet. Um, I hope you can get some time alone with God, maybe with somebody that's trusted to talk about today. Uh, do me a favor, try to go get your kids right away and then please join everybody outside. We're gonna have a time of fellowship and support the camp. And uh, again, thank you for being a church that can walk through this stuff together. God bless.